Welcome to the Impact Talks podcast from Sima Rama. This month, we focus on a documentary, Strike a Rock, from filmmaker Aliki Saragas. The film also includes two women in their fight to get justice for the 2012 Maracana massacre, when 37 striking mine workers were killed by police. I'm Donna Edwards. I'm a former congresswoman from the United States in Maryland. And I'm happy to be joined, really honored to be joined here today with um, Aliki Saragas, who's the filmmaker, and Palesa Mahdi, who's the deputy director of the Center for Applied Legal Studies. Aliki, maybe you could introduce yourself. Thanks, Donna. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be on this podcast and to talk about our film, Striker Rock. Um, so, Striker Rock was uh, really made because the voices of the women of Marikana who uh, live around the mine that is the mine uh, operated by Lonman, which is the third largest platinum producer in the world. Um, their story, which is this, this incredible story of activism and solidarity on the ground and these women who have been fighting for justice and for accountability from the Marikana massacre for now six years, um, their story had never been told. So. Uh, we endeavored to make this film with Sikala Sonke and with Pals, uh, that uh, Palesa is, is here going to talk about as well, um, to be able to really spotlight their voices and put their voices and their story on the world stage. Um, and it's been an amazing journey since then. Um, and yeah, the film's been now released for about a year and a half. So uh, it's going well and we're doing a large impact campaign with the film as well. Well, that is excellent. And so that's a great segue to introduce um, our friend here, Palesa Mahdi, who's the direct, deputy director of the Center for Applied Legal Studies. And Palesa, maybe give me some uh, and our listeners a little bit of background about you and about how you got involved with the project. So, hi, everyone. Uh, just uh, one slight correction. I'm the acting deputy director at the moment. Um, how I got to meet uh, the woman of Skala Sonke was shortly after the Marikana uh, massacre took place. And we had been trying to assist them uh, legally to protest uh, because they tried to host a peaceful march in and around their community, but the local authorities wouldn't allow them. So we were helping them in facilitating um, this peaceful protest. And We've known each other since then. We've been involved in other and related projects since then. Well, I, I have to tell you, I mean, when I saw the film, I think it's actually one of the most impactful films that I've seen in a really, really long time. And not just the film, but the story and the powerful story of these, um, of these women who together really took on, you know, the biggest of battles. And to me, it seemed kind of universal, but I wonder if um, Aliki, what you could tell me that when you were making uh, the project and the process started, were you expecting uh, the film's narrative to derive so heavily on the topic of women in politics and leadership, or did you just it just happen? Well, it's actually very interesting because I started the film as part of my master's program, and in the master's program, we were we 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 had to do a short film. And I'd read this, the most amazing article about these, the, these unheard voices of the women of Marikana. And I, I was really driven to, to want to meet with them and to be able to tell the story with them um, and to really tell, tell their story of their fight and their struggle. But at the time, it was two years after the Marikana massacre. And what I wanted to show in the film was this amazing play that the women had put on at the second year commemoration of the Marikana massacre. And um, it was always going to be a film about gender empowerment and about uh, woman empowerment and this activism and activism through the play as well, because very interestingly, it showed um, like gender roles where the women would play the parts of the, of the police, the parts of the mine workers, the parts of themselves, of the widows. Um, and through that really gave voice to this narrative that hadn't been heard about what happened in the American Massacre from their perspective. How far have the women come from when you, your involvement and you know the tools that you gave them and what are the obstacles that they still face? Sure. So a few things. I think 
One of the things that I've observed is, you know, as you mentioned, how the how in the film they really demonstrate their own sort of agency and just power of this whole process. You know, so the first thing I guess I'd like to say is we played mostly a sort of a, a, an attorney type of role. Mm-hmm. So they did most of the mobilization all by themselves. So the platforms which we played a role, which Aliki has alluded to, was the um, IFC complaint and the dispute resolution process, which we helped facilitate. But we were very clear going in there that we were not there to be their mouthpieces. We were just there to ensure that everything is done correctly. So we were more interested in the process and they told their own story. So I must say from the onset, the women have always advocated well for themselves. We were just there to assist in you know the process and to ensure that they weren't exploited or not taken as seriously as they, as, as they should be in the process. So what's ahead? So one next thing for them. What's ahead? So we are talking to them about a, a possible case that like to bring um, against the mining company Lonman uh, in order to hold them accountable for the lack of compliance of the social and labor plans, which which in summary is the commitment to their community, um, and they they set out all these commitments before they got the mining license. So by law, they're required to ensure that they meet all these um, uh, commitments that they've made in their social and labor plan. So currently, the women are looking into litigating in order to compel Lonman to ensure that there's compliance with these social and labor plans. Did you have an opportunity to really observe their relationship? And how did that impact your role in, in, in the work that they're doing? I've, I've known the women for a number of years now, and it's hard to just pro, uh, focus on just the legal process without mm-hmm. you know, feeling uh, certain emotions. It was certainly an emotional process. Um, as I may have mentioned earlier on, our first engagements with them was to help them and, and to facilitate uh, uh, um, a peaceful process uh, protest in their community. We also helped them submit evidence at the South African Human Rights Commission. And when you look at the evidence that we submitted, it essentially sets out the living conditions that they're in. And it's hard to not uh, feel the emotion there, right? There's very, um, the amounts of poverty in in, in that area is is heartbreaking. It's, it's, it makes one very upset that there's basic services that they don't have access to. You know, there's, there's children, there's women in the community. So it's hard not to um, feel angry and, and hurt with them and upset with yeah. them throughout the process and just to merely focus on this is the law, which which also um, has its limitations, right? Um, even though, you know, from both our sides, we try to ensure that what's done needs to be done and that everyone is compliant with the law. But um, yeah, so it was, it was hard to remove the emotion from the process because the substance of the complaint, the substance of the work itself is is very upsetting. Yeah, I mean, I felt that, I mean, I certainly felt that watching the film, Aliki, that um, I was angry for them, but I was angry for women because when you look at their work, not only were they organizing in their community so that they could improve the lives of their families and, you know, and certainly the uh, people who were working at the mines, but they had all kinds of other work to do just to struggle to make sure there was food on the table to make sure that, you know, their housing was as, you know, as clean and safe as it could be keeping the water out and sweeping that from coming in and overwhelming them. And I just thought um, about women's work. I mean, Aliki, it really made me think hard about the work of women and what it really takes to be a leader. And I don't know if you were, exploring that um, as you were filming. 
Definitely, that was one of also the major themes of the film, along with domestic feminism, it's also this idea of unpaid domestic labor um, that women all around the world um, have to do. Um, and I mean, really, if you if you think about it at the mines, um, um, there was this amazing uh, article by Asanda Benya about this exact this exact um, conversation that women really run the production of the minds through their unpaid uh, emotional and reproductive labor. And I think that, that 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 was also a big part of the film and one of the themes of the film is that women are expected not only to, you know, to, to keep the home and to make sure children are fed and that there's food on the table and that, you know, everyone is safe. But at the same time, there's this other responsibility that these women have which is this activist and this 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 role of leader mm-hmm. and and it's a lot of it's it's a lot of responsibility and a lot of pressure but i think it's 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 a it's a it's a role that many women have to have to uh fill in order to survive um and so yeah that that was that was a big part of the film and and forms part of this theme of domestic feminism that that we were exploring uh, Palais, I wonder, you know, sort of what do you think has to come of this? What do you think and uh, what would be, I don't know, you don't get an ideal outcome. I, I did legislation. I was a politician. I know that you don't get ideal outcomes, but you have to get, you know, something in order to keep them in the fight. Because if there's not a win down the line, then I think it's really hard to stay engaged as an activist. I think two things come to mind. The first is just South Africa has really great law, uh, um, in, in my opinion, particularly um, around the the mining sector. Yes, there's always room for improvement, and you know we we always making submissions to Parliament on how it can be improved. You know, taking into account community needs. So the first for me is just basic compliance with the law. Um, the second is just for the mining industry to operate with a conscious. I mean, that's what it is. It isn't that the law wasn't in place. I mean, they had the, um, you know, the the compliance agreements, but they just weren't complying, and there was nothing, no one in the government making them do it. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. going to add. That there's um, that there's no political will at the same time. So it's it's that these amazing laws in place um, and the mining companies are getting away with it because there's no political will to keep them in check. And the and the yeah. government has and the DMR, our Department of Mineral Resources, has the right to suspend these mining licenses, but but they don't. Um, and that's mm-hmm. that's also a big problem. I just wanted to add in, yeah. 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 Listen, do you think in all of this that the women believe that you know, if they are active and they're engaged in their political party and they win elective office, that that results in change? I don't think um, it does, but I think the problem is not just with that particular mining company. The problem Mm -hmm. is not just with that uh, local authority. The problem is not just with that particular mining department. It's like a web of problems. And there are a number of very progressive politicians, but they also operate in a very contested space. You find people within the same political parties, but who seemingly hold completely different ideologies. So yes, it's a win, you know, and it's so great to see um, Mam Primrose in the in Parliament talking about her community, demanding that you know Parliament take into account the needs of her community, calling these leaders to account. But you know, one can't, can't help but be pessimistic about you know the the bigger web of problems. Yeah. So you know that's what activism is is about. It's one small change at a time. You can't fix every. Uh, sphere of, of, of government and every level of government. And it's not often that you find even in one political party that everyone is actually saying the same thing. Right, on the so, same page. <laughs> exactly. So I'm yeah. optimistic, but at the same time, I can't help but be pessimistic. <laughs> so Aliki, I want, I mean, something that I've wondered 
strike a rock, the name, because I've found myself in these days since I watched the film actually saying that in my own fights and struggles, you know, strike a woman, strike a rock. <laughs> yeah. So that's a so that's actually a slogan from an anti-apartheid slogan from the 1950s from 1956 uh, during the women's march to the union buildings to protest the pass laws. They said "Watita bavazi, watita bogoto," which means we strike a you strike a woman, you strike a rock. And um, so that was really the inspiration behind the title. And then obviously it has a lot of mining connotations as well um, with the striking and rocks um, and um, and and. and you know, um, living the those strikes for living wage, and so there's a there's it's that's kind of where the inspiration came. So I'm glad that you've been using using the logo because it's got a lot of history um, and a lot of power. Wow, well, yeah. I mean, I I just I did, I really um, I'm so amazed both by the 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 women and the fact that they just are determined to make a change. I mean, they really, they are determined to do that and that they've managed to, you know, muddle through um, in so many ways with so many different challenges. And, you know, um, Palesa, I just, I mean, I wonder for them, you know, kind of where this, where this goes for them. And are we, do you see another sort of generation coming up of their children and young people who feel the same activism? Because this is not a battle that's going to be won um, in the next year or maybe not even in the next decade. So one of the things I've recently reflected on um, is Back then, a few years ago, when I met the women of Skala Songe, they had just recently, at the time, established and formally registered uh, themselves as, you know, as, as an NGO. And now they, I mean, I'm, 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 I work for an NGO, so we always, in various uh, convenings uh, on, on, about various issues, and particularly issues around the mining sector, and they have such a presence at the moment. Um, back a, a, few, a few years ago, we would invite them, please come speak at this panel. Nowadays, it's standard that Skala Sonke is on the agenda. You know, they definitely Mam Primrose, Mam Tumak is somewhere to be found in, in these discussions. So they have grown, they are present and they're here to stay. Um, so I have no doubt that they haven't only um, imprinted themselves in the civil society in South Africa, but certainly for their community as well. So I have no doubt that those that come after them will definitely follow in their footsteps. Well, Aliki, I wonder how that makes you feel in terms of having been able to, you know, pull this together and tell this story and to see the power of it, not just in the storytelling, but in the activism. Yeah, that's been um, an amazing journey for for me. I mean, this being my first uh, feature uh, documentary feature and our first real impact campaign with the film, and we really from the beginning said that we wanted to create a film that can make, create some kind of change and that can be used as a tool for Sikala Sonke and for other mining communities. As Palesa said, it's it's not unique to Marikana. So, um, so we, we've 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 done a couple of of various. Um, kind of interventions within our impact campaign. One of them is um, is impact screening. So we allow anybody to screen the film all around the world. They just need to contact us and we provide them with a toolkit and then they can screen the film. And uh, a lot of the time, uh, you know, the we actually push that most of the time someone from Sikala Sonke, either Mam Tumeko or Mam Primrose, if it's not overseas are there to talk after the film because it's very important for us that they own their story and that they uh, uh, are the ones to provide the Q&A and to lead the activism. So because of that, we've had like over 70 screenings around the world, which is fantastic. And often after the screenings, there are uh, uh, they collect donations for Sikala Sonke that goes to them directly. We went to last year with the film, we went on a screening tour um, of the UK with Mam Tumeka and Mam Primrose. And we were outside Lonman's headquarters in London picketing on the 50th anniversary of the Marikana Massacre. We were outside the South African Human Rights Commission and now in October, Primrose and I are going to the anti-corruption conference in Copenhagen um, to, to, to talk again about Tikala Sonke, to talk again about the Marikana massacre and what changes need to be made. 
So um, it's that it's been so it's been so amazing to be able to go on this journey with them and for Sikala Sonke to own Striker Rock and to own the film and to talk back to it in a way that gives them power and empowers them as well and and empowers the other women of Sikala Sonke with them. Um, and hopefully can can keep bringing support to them. Um, we also have a petition that 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 people sign after the after the screening. So, um, and there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. We're also with doing community screenings with Carl's. So um, Carl's has a, a social labor plan toolkit that they've developed and. Um, and they go into communities to be able to teach various communities about the social labor plan that's specific to their community. And then in some occasions, we, we screen Striker Rock as well, and Mam Tumeka will have a conversation with the people of that community about their challenges and what they've overcome themselves. And we're also doing feminist screenings as well with uh, feminist organizations where they also talk. So it's been this, it's like this amazing um, multifaceted and multi-layered um uh impact that we're trying to do with the film and it's almost it's has a it's like um uh, has a life of its own which is i'm so grateful for that it is kind of grows and expands and people use it as a tool in every way that assists them um and assists and in doing so assists the story of marikana and the women as well so yeah it was something that i'm very excited about Wow. Well, this has been, you know, a really great um, discussion and, you know, for me to hear about the journey, because I will tell you, I mean, I was completely inspired and uh, because I think that the, the story of the, the struggle in Maracana is really a universal struggle. And it's one that's, that was engaged in by, um, by women who share the same concerns that you can find anywhere for themselves, their families, their communities. Um, and I, I just found it completely inspiring. And so I just want to thank uh, the two of you for the work that you continue to do um, for um, uh, Akili Saragasa. Thank you so much for the filmmaking, for Palesa Madi, uh, for your continued assist with the advocacy to make sure that the women's voices in Maracana are heard and that change is made and um, to continue to tell the story. And hey, I may even get my own toolkit. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Thank you so much for the conversation. Thanks,